Okay, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, time for us also uh, now to get going with the second session, the most amazing session for the day I personally have been waiting for is the audience engagement session. How do you do things remotely for an organization when their workforce, when the sizable amount of the workforce is working from home? And taking us through this lovely experience for us is the director of Difference Consulting, uh, Mr. Rupert Picardo. Uh, Difference is uh, purely an employee experience and team building organization and the increase in companies seeking to conduct uh, activities and engagements for its employees. It's only befitting that a company like this rises to the occasion and I'm sure they have a lot up their sleeve. Little about uh, Rupert, he is also the co-founder of a brand of escape rooms called Mystery Junkies and he continues to uh, conduct leadership programs for some of the best known companies in India and Asia. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Rupert Ricardo as he enlightens us on how to keep people engaged online, how to gauge the interest and how to interact with an audience through a virtual platform. So finding a new route to your audience, ladies and gentlemen, here we go with uh, the one, the only, Rupert Picardo. Thanks, Riaz. That was very nice. Um, all right, right, let's um, let me try and share my screen first and tell me if you guys are able to see it. There we go, just a sec. And yep, I'm guessing all of you can see my screen. Okay, so shall we begin? Um, Yep, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining and welcome to this brief discussion on how to better productivity through employing, uh, through remote engagement. My apologies, yes, through remote engagement. Now, officially, we're on day 11 of lockdown in India. But for a lot of us, we've been working from home or for home uh, for far longer than that. And if you're like most of the millions of people in this situation, not just in India, but around the world, I'd say that you're really feeling the pain right now, pain of not having those interactions, of not meeting up with your colleagues, the coffee chats, the, um, you know, the uh, lunchroom storytelling, and uh, you know, just meeting up with your colleagues at work, our friends at work, I would say. In other words, I think this is what we call disengaged. Um, chances are that this is leading to some feeling of low productivity, of not achieving what you set out to do for the day or the week. And now you're getting close to finding someone or something um, to blame. So one of those could be connectivity, uh, the technology, it's the managers, the noise at home, probably what you're hearing in my background as well, or saying that my audio is not too clear. All of these are you know, the complaints that you're gonna have. Uh, it's a long list and it's getting a lot more creative as we keep going ahead. Now, if you're in this proverbial boat of being a little bit disengaged, you definitely are going to relate to the session. Uh, we're going to have two parts to the session. One is about the engagement per se, and the second is about productivity. So the next 15 minutes or so, let's try to understand what engagement is, why is it critical, and also how can it affect productivity. Let's aim by the end of the session to have a simple to-do list, uh, you know, something on remote engagement, something that we can take back and say, okay, this is where we're headed, this is where the future is. And collectively, let's also work out how these insights might help us in the field of uh, experiential engagement. I know that Riaz already spoke a little bit about me. Uh, I'm just going to do a short introduction in any case. Uh, my name is Rupert Picardo. I'm a leadership coach. I run uh, programs for leaders, uh, for not just leaders, for literally anyone in the organization. I'm a TEDx speaker. I'm also the founder director of Difference Mr. Junkies and we the team that in. Now, these businesses, these three businesses, that's Difference, Mr. Junkies, and LeaderTeam.in, uh, these are primarily in the field of employee and uh, people engagement, team building, internal communication, learning programs. And until a month ago, it was heavily dependent on human interaction. Facilitated sessions, one-to-one, one-to-many, and uh, pretty much activity-oriented for all groups. So just like... I'd say every other industry or similar industries, we have seen disruption too. Uh, not surprisingly, I've got a lot of calls from customers, colleagues, friends, well-wishers, and uh, people from the industry, from different industry. And the course of these conversations, um, I'm getting this one question again and again. Is it really possible to engage teams that work remotely? Now, the simple answer to this is a resounding yes. So that doesn't answer the question or the following question which is how or why. Uh, so I'm going to take a few minutes to explain. Now, team building and experiential engagement has a bond. Primarily because teams have a bond. What we see today in terms of experiential engagement has only been around for, you know, pardon me for saying, 14 years or so, uh, at least in India. Uh, that's the time since we incorporated. 
But there were other forms of engagement prior to this, and uh, even the terms actually, team building or just teams, have not really been cast in stone. Uh, you probably forget that as recently as in the second industrial era, people at factories were still called workers. But for them to be productive, we still need to find ways to keep them engaged. Uh, it's only in the third industrial revolution that we really began to recognize teams as such. Now, we have no idea what these are going to be called in Industry 4.0 or uh, the fourth revolution. In fact, uh, considering everything that's happened right now, we're probably already at Industry 5.0. Now, in the last 25 years, we've seen the functioning of these distributed teams. Um, an organization in, say, uh, New York has had subsidiaries in the UK, in, um, uh, Bangalore, India, Malaysia, Australia, a lot of other places. And people have worked around the clock delivering products or services across the world. Now, these are distributed teams that innovate more teams. I think the change what we're seeing in the current scenario right now is that we're probably moving towards a lot more individuals working remotely. Um, that's really the biggest change. Now, the basics are still the same as far as we're concerned. If you have people working, they'll likely be in some form of collaborative culture. And that collaborative culture is what needs to be built and nurtured in order to drive efficiency, creativity, and your desired output. Just because people are not going to be in the same physical office uh, when they're working doesn't mean that they, they're not bonded by a desire to be collaborative. So if that desire, that desire to be collaborative exists, sorry, yes. Yeah, sorry, Rupert. Uh, you know, your voice is not that clear. We've been getting a lot of uh, messages from people saying your voice is not that clear. <laughs> is, is it possible for you to plug in a uh, headphone? Is it, do you... Or Let me just see if I can change the audio settings and make this a little more louder. Yeah, my... this is better now. Now this is better. I don't know what happens when you... So is it on the screen share? Yeah, maybe on the screen share. Maybe. Okay, let me just hope that things are a little better right now. Yes, uh, things are better right now, yes. All right. If uh, yeah, you can see it. better than what it was earlier, and I'm going to try and come as close as I can to the mic without looking like I'm swallowing it. So if you can just give me a shout out for this. Right. So um, I forgot where I was. Um, let's just see what the next screen is. Oh, my screen share is not there. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I was telling you that uh, what we're really looking at is a collaborative culture a culture where you know, the desire to be collaborative is probably a lot better. Um, now, a lot of people have a different view when it comes to collaboration in the workplace. And not just you know, whether it is needed, but I'd say a lot of people are questioning whether it actually exists naturally. So I'm going to go a little further back in time, but let me warn you that uh, this is a heavily biased and opinionated version of uh, evolution the way I see it, and I'm probably you know, going to be backed by a few colleagues in the organization about uh, evolution the way we see it. Yeah. So pretty early on, we humans realized that uh, you know, we are pretty disadvantaged. We have some serious limitations to survival. Um, no teeth, no claws, uh, no you know, uh, great strength or agility, and a long list of what we didn't have. But there are two critical things that we did have, thumbs and communication. One of these helped us to build tools, the other has helped us to collaborate. Collaborate as tribes, collaborate to survive. So the point I'm making is that this is something that's been inherent to us. No doubt that competitiveness you know, uh, is what helped our uh, race grow. If you look at even the modern uh, world, an organization, a team that uh, you know, breaks away from the organization and wants to uh, you know, access some of the resources available and be competitive in the market, that's what helps markets as well as the world to grow. But I think it's critical for us to understand that we collaborated before we competed. Now, whether we work remotely or in the same office, we have to remember these two things. One is to communicate and the other is to collaborate. That's really what we need to be doing. And this is the one area that we see a lot of managers and possibly entire organizations falling short. Because this is a key factor of engagement, driving purpose but essentially collaborating for a common goal. 
Now, if you haven't given it a thought yet with all this lockdown and everything else that's happening, there's something to mull over. In the current environment and possibly the immediate future, we will no longer be thinking about a great place to work, but rather a great team to work with. Because it's no longer about the physical location or the physical office, at least for the immediate. So these are pretty much the basics of engagement and collaboration. This is the first part, the engagement that I spoke about. Now, the second part that I want to address is about productivity. And bear with me while I stitch all of this together for the remote engagement and how does it affect our industry in terms of the experience. So before we get on anything else on the productivity, I wanted to uh, uh, run a quick poll for all of you. So I think uh, Yuvraj is going to post that poll. I've got a slightly different version of it here. I'm going to put that on the screen and uh, feel free to answer this. If you don't get the poll showing up for you, then, oh, there you've got the poll. I'll give you 30 seconds. I'll have a drink for them. All right, basically 30 seconds to try and answer this. Don't just look for the... Um, Apparently, I had to submit the poll as well. Okay. Yeah. While we wait for those poll results, I'm going to go out on a limb here and tell you a little bit about what I understand these productivity concerns to be. Um, you know, I recently was reading an article uh, where a study was quoted, a study conducted by VultureCloud.com in the UK. Now, this states that an average person is productive for just or less than three hours in a day. I think the study talks about two hours and 23 minutes. So that is taking out everything else which is non-work related. On my own experience, as well as what we see with, uh, you know, in all the years that we've been working and working with teams and things like that, I'd say we hover closer to the four hours. But consider that we expect our working day to be 10 or more hours in India. We typically call it a lot more than 10 hours as terms of our working hours. And that, oh, there we go. So four hours is what we've got as a maximum. I'm getting the results. There's some people who are saying six or more hours. I'd say that uh, either it's an integrity issue or we are including the Bangalore traffic into uh, the poll. I love the people who says two hours max. Uh, I'd like to know what their job is and I'd like to apply to those as well. But yes, uh, uh, the majority is showing uh, four hours and I think that's where we are. But uh, coming back to what we're talking about, uh, we're suddenly working from home and it seems like we have a lot of time. Uh, some things get done and some things just don't get done. Uh, you know, it's, it's the first week, the first few days, it felt like there were a lot of distractions, a lot of things happening all around us. And now suddenly it feels like no matter what we do, there's a lot of time. There's, there's so much that we can do in the day. And we're finding it hard to cope with this. And guess what? More than us, it's the leaders and the managers who are finding it hard to cope with something like this. The more we are seeing this, managers are scheduling online meetings and dragging some of these calls way longer than needed. In just the last few days since I started preparing for the session, I spoke to numerous contacts in different industries, and the story is pretty much the same. I was asking one of my friends uh, who said that I need to schedule a uh, call now. I said, what's the call about? He said, uh, we need to get 10 people for a catch-up. I said, catch-up? What's that? I mean, for what? What kind of catch-up are you going to do? He says, well, to get a rundown of what happened since yesterday. And I said, why? And there was a pause. And then it was, what else do we do? You're basically trying to find things that we don't have to do in the day and think about how we don't try and occupy time. And this really affects our productivity. So the, we have to recognize a few things and get to this. A, we do have a lot of time. B, some of these distractions are no longer distractions for us. And C, four hours of productivity is a lot of time. It's a lot of time in the day. So here's a quick tip sheet in terms of just the productivity part of it. If you're looking at it, we've already discussed that we have more time. We're getting the ability to have more focus, the things that are distracting us in the first week of this work from home and the forced lockdown, I would say, 
currently we see that we have that much more productive time available. So if you have more time, what are you doing with that? So you need to define that extra time. How do you put aside time for playing with children, garden time, uh, bonsais, creative projects? You've got to understand what the limitations are in the current environment. And more than anything else, if you're a manager or a leader, you need to create that breathing space for your uh, team members. I think that is critical because they are facing this thing. They don't know what else has to be done. So don't try and just keep giving them things to do for the heck of it. So now that we know, you know a little bit about what productivity is and a little bit about remote management, let's try and figure out how to put this together, which is productivity through remote management. And no matter what, in this current environment, your team is missing critical elements of the workplace that you can't provide for them, not in the media. And that is the interaction with team. Uh, time together, those lunch breaks that we spoke about, storytelling, uh, team breaks, smoke breaks. Uh, just sitting in a conference room, turning up the air conditioning on high and having a chat for 10 minutes. All those things which we discarded from the productivity part of it, that's something that we cannot provide. And let's face it, I think in some form or the other, we've got to accept going back to our evolution, that we are tribal in nature. We do need that bonfire and that little dance and the ritualistic dance around that bonfire just to kind of feel that we are we have something to celebrate. I think that's what keeps us together as a tribe as well. So how do we provide this and to whom? I think uh, this is where I see that, you know, from the experience and the experiential industry part of it, a lot of agencies, marketers, uh, not just now, for some time have been choosing the path of lower resistance by going with the larger groups and very generic and generalized events. This is ultimately aimed at individuals uh, gathering together or doing something together. And yes, I mentioned individuals because a lot of things have become generic. But if you really want to look at B2B, you know, the B2B space, the smallest functional unit of an organization is not an individual, but it's a team. Irrespective of where the team is, or even if it comprises of individuals working remotely, I think the collaborative effort of what they're trying to achieve is what makes the organization successful. I think this is where we need to focus uh, all the experiences that we are creating, because at the end of the day, this is what the organization is focused on too. Therefore, if you ask me what the future of our experiential industry is uh, looking like, I'd say at some form it is aimed at the team level. And I'm not just saying this because, hey, we do team building. It's not because of that, because as we said earlier, the world's fun on its head if it had one. It shifted around. So uh, it's not just because of the industry we are in, but we see that this is what it is. Uh, no doubt it will change the industry, more production and work for smaller events, squeeze budgets, a lot of virtual events, good thing for that. But in looking at the larger picture, I strongly believe that the smaller and focused team building uh, and sort of the team based experience are going to be the norm in the near future. So, I want to do a quick recap with all of you before we start questions. Uh, one, there is a need for engagement. It's not something new, it's always been there. Uh, irrespective of whether you're calling it workers, teams, or whatever else you're going to call it next. So collaboration is inherent. We work with that purpose. Uh, we tend to bond together. And when we have that purpose and we know what we're trying to achieve, uh, that's when you, know, you see the best out of all of us. And that's how we work. Remote or live, or as Raju said earlier, digital, it could be any of these. Uh, that's only the medium by which we're going to be engaging. Recognize our limitations right now. We need to be upping the game, and our experiences should be in the teams. Now, in a very morbid and ironic way, it's the current virus that is showing us the power of growing, of going to the cell level, you know, to the smallest functional unit. The virus, of course, as we know, is trying to weaken the system. But I think what we need to be looking at out here is driving the experience and the engagement one team at a time, which is still, again, the smallest functioning unit of any organization. Build these so that we build that productivity and help organizations become more successful. As organizations start recognizing that this is where they are, uh, this is where they want to be, they're going to start looking at those, even if it's smaller budgets, smaller experiences. I think this is what the need is. Especially now, with, uh, you know, having teams a little more remote and working. Uh, I mean, if you look at it a few, a few weeks from now, you're only going to get 50% of the uh, team getting back in office, 50% choosing to work from home, and different percentages on this. 
the future for us, I think, is going to be very different and to look at the world uh, in whatever way is far bigger and the people are going to be a little farther away. But teams will still need to connect and they will need to collaborate, share experiences and bond. So irrespective of whether the engagement will be remote or live or digital, we need to be there to create the experience to captivate and motivate them to improve productivity and set the tone for the new industry. So uh, for now, for the next few weeks, for the next few months or whatever, remote engagement uh, is something that is hot, it's trending. Our companies have been calling us, our companies have been trying. It's, uh, it's been a really creative and exciting time in the last few weeks, coming up with so many new ideas. We didn't think this kind of creative disruption was possible, and we look forward uh, to uh, what's going to change in the next few weeks as well. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, for thank, thank you so much, uh, Rupert. Uh, it was a very valuable presentation that was made uh, by you right now. Of course, it's going to leave a few of us thinking as to how we can go do things uh, better from now on, considering the given scenario. Uh, but that apart, now we have some questions coming out from people. Guys, any questions that you have, you can start pinging them onto the Q&A tab. We have the first question here, Rupert, uh, which says, do you think that organizations need to revisit their values and vision considering the new norm today? Also, what is that one value you would want all companies to have given the current state of events? Uh, I feel it's a little too early. Vision is not something that can possibly change within you know, just a few uh, weeks. Uh, there, there is going to be a little bit of time for us to, uh, you know, to kind of like take a step back, see where we are going. A lot of people are reacting very quickly, but I think we know that in some form or the other, there's going to be, uh, you know, this, this is a temporary thing. Whether it's five years temporary or 10 years or just five months, uh, we don't know that yet. I think we need to take a little longer just to kind of uh, figure out in terms of whether we want to change. And what's the one value you want all companies to have given the current state of events? Uh, I'd say that with everything going a little more distant, the social distancing, working from home and things like that, I think now it's far more important for us to get closer and to connect. I think that's what we need to be doing. Great. Okay, so we've got another question right now, which is, how or what do you define as the KPIs of a good engagement program? How do you measure its success? I'm going to need a full half an hour for this, Anthony. Uh, let's connect separately if, if we have to define the KPIs of a good engagement program. But I'll give you one example. Uh, it, it always starts with what a customer is looking at. Uh, they, it starts off with a brief in terms of an engagement. Sometimes it is about, uh, you know, uh, my team's facing issues on just being able to communicate that much more clearly. So it could be something as simple as that. It could be a 10 minute engagement that we're going to be running, uh, drive this through, you know, on, on a single activity based platform, uh, run it again repeatedly, maybe once every month, two months, until we're able to measure and say that, yes, the issues that we saw earlier are no longer there. But uh, there's no one size fits all for the KPIs or in terms of the measurement. Okay, um, this is my personal question, okay, Rupert. I know these are challenging times. I know every client out there is going to look to cut the frills first to start with because everybody's going to use this as an excuse. Uh, you know, I, I can't fathom a situation where um, they're going to be only working and doing nothing because all work makes Jack a dull work. Right? So they will need to do some activity. They will need to do something to keep them in good spirits apart from just giving them the salaries and taking the juice out of people, if I may put it that way in a crass uh, way. But uh, give, given the scenario, they're going to be you know, cutting everybody to size and cutting down the budgets as well. But still, yeah, they'll have to do some kind of spend. So what kind of agencies or what kind of uh, teams do you think will get that piece of the pie? Uh, in terms of uh, the squeezed budgets and, uh, yes. you know, how, well, uh, you know, everyone's reinventing themselves. Uh, you know, the, an activity that would have costed X earlier because it required a lot of props and facilitators and uh, travel and transport and so many other elements. If we're going to try and do that remotely right now and expect to charge that same X, I don't think that's going to be fair either. A lot of things have changed. So everyone is trying to assess. Now, we know that budgets are going to come down, but I think it's got to be, you know, also within those bounds of uh, being reasonable. Is the activity going to actually get you what you want or is the engagement going to get you what you want? I think that has to be the first criteria. So in terms of who's going to get these uh, uh, events, uh, you know, it's 
literally a new industry there right now. I think it's a great opportunity for uh, all of us who are in that space to find ways to collaborate and uh, establish uh, you know, our, our, our opera stamp of uh, authority in terms of what we do as uh, engagement experts now. So there's far more room for collaboration rather than trying to fight for smaller pieces of the pie, I think. Okay, uh, I don't know if you agree with me. Who, um, I think the first move in terms of the uh, cost reduction, proactively reducing the cost works better or uh, do you have to wait for them to ask you to reduce costs? <laughs> Well, yeah, it, it, uh, see, so as part of our brainstorming things that we've been doing, we've looked at every activity that we've come up with, uh, you know, we've, we've tried to put it in either a bucket that we can monetize or we shouldn't monetize, not that we can't, but that we shouldn't monetize because it's, uh, it may be something unique, but it becomes very replicable. These are the ones that we're ready to give our customers and our partners for free saying that go ahead and use this. Yes, we've come up with this. We've created it but maybe it's not something that we want to monetize. The ones where we see far better value of what we're doing, we're going to monetize. And when it comes to those, I think uh, to a large extent, we will possibly try and uh, define the benchmark and the price point out there. So in other words, uh, agencies who are better prepared to immediately execute what they have worked upon all this while, they will get the first piece of the pie because they will have the bandwidth, of course, to offer people something to experience it free of cost uh, to tight the times, of course, and of course, uh, monetize on things that they have as a better value proposition. So value proposition will hold key to this. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So anybody else has got a question? I think we've got four more questions here and we've got time here. Will remote engagement be the norm even after COVID? Um, it's too early to say. I mean, if we really could uh, say this, Raghu, then uh, we'd probably be setting up gypsy tents and having a crystal ball. No one saw this coming. I think it's going to be very difficult. And anyone who says it is going to be the norm at this point of time uh, hasn't really been shook up enough by the changes that have happened. So I would say that we, we really need to see that there's no doubt there's going to be a market for it, but I'm not too sure if it's going to be the norm. Okay. Our other question is, you spoke about connectivity and bond. There have been times agencies feel the factor of insecurity to connect vendors directly to their clients for briefs, fearing they might lose to the client to those vendors. How do we work on this? I think this is just a habitual question. Uh, I think we uh, need to, but it's just a question of trust. I think we need to start out there. We shake, I mean, we can't shake hands right now, but uh, we uh, kind of like uh, make a promise that uh, it's not about uh, someone trying to steal a customer or something like that. Customer has a need. There's a partner who can provide that need. I think we need to trust each other and say, let's make this happen. Okay. Our next question, Do you, does remote engagement mean engaging only digitally or does it have a combination of offline as well? It, it does. Uh, I think uh, that's where I agree with what uh, Rajesh was talking about earlier, the digital, there's physical and digital. I think that's what we will be looking at. So it's not that all aspects are going to be digital. We're going to get bored of this very soon. I think I'm already ready for a digital detox. It's too much of devices and online and things like that. I'm sure everyone's going to face that very quickly. Uh, so we, we have to look at engaging people with a little more tactile, something, you know, that they can touch and feel. So hopefully once delivery and things like that open up that we can send, uh, you know, props and kits to people. So you're not really doing everything purely digital. Tell me about it. You know, uh, too much of digital is happening now. I think it's getting to our head. I think after all of this ends, uh, for me personally, I would love to just go away for 15 days and not look at any, anything digital <laughs> and come back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question. Great presentation, Rupert. Do you think social distancing is the right term to be used in this case? We don't want people to be distanced socially, physically, yes, especially in the age of diverse remote engagement. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, semantics, Kiran, but uh, honestly, I agree entirely with what you're asking. Uh, and that's why I said the one value that we need to take back from all of this and what managers should be looking at is it's not just about uh, with all these other things that have come in that we can't go out, we can't meet people and we can't interact with our teams. It's really a time for us to get closer. So whether you call it getting closer socially on social media or any other digital methods, just pick up the phone and speak to people, get in touch with your friends. I think that's something that's needed more right now, more than ever. Okay. Imagine, okay. Imagine on a lighter note, you know, if, if the PM of our country had said, please maintain physical distance, that would have sounded bad. Yes. Social distancing sounds better. 
right? So they could fit in India in any case. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right. Uh, thank you so much for taking those questions with us. Uh, I think we have just one last question. It shouldn't be called lockdown or social distancing. It should be called being grounded. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. Okay. Call it whatever you may like, but uh, please maintain distance at the moment and uh, continue maintaining it for the next couple of months as well, because I don't know if this is going to go down anytime soon. But uh, nevertheless, thank you so much, Rupert, for having taken on, uh, taken your time out for uh, this lovely summit. It uh, couldn't have been complete without your presence and your team's presence. So thank you so much.